Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Coming up in the news this week, Earth. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal Scientific Reports has looked at the possibility that the very beginnings of the molecules needed for life originated on Earth thanks, in part, to volcanic and meteoritic activity. The study looks back at an Earth that bubbled and burst on the surface 4.4 billion years ago, an Earth that is very different to the one that can support life today. The researchers were looking for the beginnings of reactive organic molecules, which is one of the early building blocks of life on this planet. Because, as it is believed, life originated on Earth only around half a billion years after the formation of the planet, that leaves a fairly short time span for these molecules to form, meaning they have formed while the Earth was in this early state, being pelted with meteors and overcome with volcanic activity. A range of conditions was simulated for this Hadean Earth finding that the iron-rich meteoritic and volcanic particles activate and catalyse CO2 into these organic molecules. Another piece in the puzzle then, perhaps, in how life on this planet started. And now over to Ben, with three more bits of news, and then three more bits of not news. Thanks Doug. First up in the paleontology news this week, there's been a new paper describing some bones from a very poorly known group of prehistoric mammals. Gondwanatheria are a grouping of extinct mammals that lived during the Cretaceous period and into the Cenozoic, and lived on the southern continents, hence the name. They were only represented by tooth, jaw, and skull remains up until the discovery of the incredible and pretty much complete Adelotherium, which you may recognise from its inclusion in the recent season of Prehistoric Planet. Well, this paper now reports on the second ever discovery of postcranial material from a Gondwanatherian. A single tail vertebra is described, found in the same formation as that in which Adelotherium is known, but they refer this bone to a different species, Vintana certicae. Vintana is actually the largest known mammal from the Mesozoic of Gondwana, and so the relatively large size of this vertebra led them to assign it to that species. The fossil is important in showing how the tail anatomy of Vintana was relatively wider and shorter than Adelotherium, and also extending the known environment and temporal range that this mammal existed in. So, a very cool discovery there, adding some much needed data to the record of Gondwanatherian mammals. There's more mammal news this week, as next up we have a new paper describing a new genus of diprotodontid from Australia. Diprotodontids were the biggest of the marsupials, including the well-known diprotodon, which could reach the size of a rhino. This paper describes some new material of a diprotodontid called Zygomaturus kianii from South Australia, but find that this species is actually different enough from Zygomaturus trilobus, the type species of the genus, to be named as its own genus, so it is now called Ambulator kianii. Looking at the characteristics of the limbs, the researchers found that Ambulator was graviportal, meaning it had adaptations for weight bearing, and found that it was better adapted to quadrupedal walking than earlier diprotodontids were. This might be explained by the change in habitat that occurred as more open environments spread across Australia, meaning these animals had to walk further to find food. One of the most amazing things about this new paper though, is the fact that they also describe soft tissue structures associated with the fossil, namely foot pads on the bottom of the left foot, showing how this animal supported itself on fleshy cushions. Sadly, the pads were actually prepped away from the fossil before they were recognised as soft tissue structures, and so they only exist in the CT scans of the fossil that were done before preparation. An absolutely amazing new discovery of a diprotodontid then, adding to the known data of these wonderful marsupials. And finally for the news this week, we've got more fossils from Australia, as the oldest pterosaurs found in the country have just been reported. Coming from the Lower Cretaceous of Victoria, it's quite fragmentary but still clearly of pterosaurian origin. One of the fossils is a partial synsacrum, part of the hip, and the other is a left metacarpal four, one of the bones of the wing. Characteristics of the bones mean that the synsacrum is from an indeterminate member of the Archaeopterodactyloids or the Pteranodontians, whereas the metacarpal cannot be determined beyond being a pterosaur of some sort. However, the metacarpal is quite different from such bones reported from Australia before, in that it's much smaller, so the researchers suspect it is from a juvenile individual. Although they're very isolated bones, they do extend the known range of pterosaurs in Australia, both in time and geographically, 
showing that these animals were able to inhabit high latitude regions, and adding to the growing understanding of Australian pterosaurs. Well, that's it for the news this week. Back to Dog in the Studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time.